and Smetty here. Dun, 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 dun. Welcome to yet another edition of Golik and Smetty. I'm Michael Golik Sr. She is Jess Matana. And we are now post-Thanksgiving and smack dab yeah. in the middle of, obviously, NFL and college football, but also the World Cup. So first and foremost, Jess, how was Thanksgiving and how were the wonderful things that you baked? I'm still recovering. It was It was too much food. I was in the South, so it was like butter on butter on butter. <laughs> And leftovers. I made cornbread. That was really good. But I ate like 20 little cornbread rolls probably over the span of like 10 hours. I just need to, I just need a break. I don't I don't feel great, Mike. So I want to ask a question. We're going to talk to Eric uh, Winalda in a, in a bit here. Uh, former U.S. men's national team was part of three World Cup teams. He's going to break down World Cup for us a bit in your cornbread. Is there actual kernels of corn? Because I've had it both ways, where mm. there is and when there isn't. I, I don't really have a preference either way. I just wonder if that what kind of cornbread you had. Mine does not. I use cornmeal. Okay. Some you can you can make like a cornbread like pudding thing with corn kernels in it, and it is delicious. I used to eat that in South Dining Hall at Notre Dame, like three times a week oh um but this cornbread no this was pumpkin cornbread oh. it was delicious i actually don't want to talk about it though because i'm getting nauseous just thinking about how much of it i ate how was your thanksgiving though mike you, i know you went out to dinner so it was yeah a little different it definitely year. a little different you know because there was only four of us me chris my daughter sydney and her husband ben um well and and the five dogs and the five, and dogs, the five dogs the five dogs were left at home uh for oh, this okay. and with four people it's like <laughs> Didn't want to deal with prep. Didn't want to deal with cleanup. So Turkey, we went yeah. to a local restaurant out here in Scottsdale. It was fantastic. Wonderful meal. And we did it early. We did it like at 1230. So holy, that is really oh, early. Yes. That's brunch. I am a complete fan of the one o'clock Thanksgiving dinner. What? Oh, yeah. Because that way I have seconds at about three or four. And then for the third game at like seven or eight o'clock, you have dinner. I'm into yeah. turkey sandwiches and that okay. kind of thing. So I am a monster fan, monster fan of the early dinner. And that's what we did. It was wonderful. No prep, no cleanup. And I sat and watched and we'll get into it. All three games were pretty good. And be yeah. because there wasn't a crowd of family around to have to talk with, I could, we could just sit and watch a little game, nap a little bit. Walk the dogs. It was it was a wonderful day. I'm not going to lie. I do love the being able to watch all of the games and and being able to turn Thanksgiving into three meals. I did that last year. Big fan of that. But this year we did the the normal time. We ate at like four thirty five o'clock. Um, but it it doesn't work if you want to stay awake for that eight p.m. game, which is too late yeah. for Thanksgiving. Yeah. I I slept through the entire I did not I was not awake for a single minute of that game. I think I fell asleep at eight o'clock on Thanksgiving. As soon as we got home from Thanksgiving, I was out cold, didn't watch any of the Vikings game. I can't believe Kirk Cousins pulled off a yeah. victory. We'll talk about it after the interview. But I'm a, I'm a fan of what you did, Mike, and I think you're onto something with the whole not having to clean up thing because that is absolutely the worst part of thanksgiving it's a killer you get so full and then you have to stand there at the sink for like yeah three hours and wash off people's dishes i don't think so yep. i like what you did i might do that yep. next year not not digging that part of it at all all right we're gonna get to eric in a minute real quick because of the time and i know we'll talk we'll, we'll ask eric this is such a difference in watching the world cup now because of the timing of the year with football going on I don't. It's too much. I don't find myself. Much. I would normally watch World Cup in the summer, just turn it on and be watching it. But I don't find myself doing that as much because there's so much American football on. There, especially this weekend, being the end of the group stage and one of the biggest college football weekends of the entire year. Also, you know, big NFL weekend. Not so much in terms of playoff implications or anything but thanksgiving is always you know there's always big games on thanksgiving i guess other than you know the lions game every year but i'm with you mike growing up i really fell in love with watching soccer because of the world cup being on in the summertime when i didn't have to go to school every morning so it is kind of a bummer thinking about all the young people in the states who 
have to go to school and can't watch all of the games because that that was something that I looked forward to every four years watching you know the World Cup in Germany and South Africa and and like having your whole June and July dedicated to just soccer there's nothing else going on in the sports calendar here I know it's very American centrist to see it that way because other parts of the world has school different times of year and other sports that they pay attention to but this is really like the big thing everyone in the world watches I love having it on in the summer and it has been really overwhelming having you know World Cup plus NFL plus college football there's also hockey and basketball on college basketball started there was big college basketball games over the weekend it's too much, Mike. It's just too much. It, it is a lot. It is a lot to take in. But right now, let's take in some World Cup and let's have a conversation with, again, he had three uh, three times was on the World Cup uh, uh, team, on the men's national team in 90, 94, and 98. Uh, Eric Ronaldo, we're going to chat with. Okay, Eric, so the U.S. men's national team has made it through to the knockout round. Big win over Iran. You were part of a, a big game like this a couple decades ago. What? How, how difficult is it to play in a game like this as a player with all of the political importance on the team, with the it being you know a knockout game, all the eyes are on you? Like how, how difficult is it to play in this game if you're a player? But it is, it is always, it's never fun, uh, when all, especially when the opposition is trying to politicize everything. I, I think what was really uh, a fantastic indicator that we were going to be okay was uh, our captain, Tyler Adams, in answering some of the questions that were thrown at him. He, he mispronounced Iran. He said Iran. Uh, they kind of came after him. They asked him about racism. They asked him about a lot of things. And his answers were, 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 were just completely classy and, and not dismissive. Uh, and, and I thought that, that at that moment, you, you felt, OK, we have leadership in this team. Uh, this is a team that can handle uh, the big moment. And certainly they did. So um, it's it's it, the tournament didn't go particularly perfect for us. Uh, but uh, to get into that knockout stage was always the goal. I am a Dutch uh, American. So this one's interesting. Uh, you know, I have Dutch heritage, so we're, we're going to play against the Netherlands now. And uh, that is an opponent that has somewhat struggled in this competition. They only managed two shots against Ecuador. That's, that's something to think about. So when we, when we look at this uh, next game, uh, it's an unbelievable opportunity. But I couldn't be more proud of these guys, you know, to, to be able to withstand all the media, all the pressure, all the distractions. Uh, but, but lock in, focus on, on, on what we needed to do today, get it done. And move on. So I, I'm I'm interested in just the feeling overall because in my sport of, of football, the Super Bowl is the biggest game we play, and it's the most popular sport in the United States. But soccer is the most popular sport in the world. You were on three World Cup teams for the U.S. Just give me the feeling of that when the World Cup comes around and you go on the pitch and, and you're representing the United States in the World Cup. Just that that overall feeling. You know, it, it, there's a lot of things that happen, Mike. I mean, you, it, you know, the first World Cup didn't go so well for me. Uh, I got thrown out the first game. <laughs> Maybe I thought I was playing football. I don't know. But I went to war uh, and I learned a great lesson. But, you know, walking out on the field, I think, you know, we played in the, the old Detroit Silverdome. Uh, we got a result and I scored a goal in that game. Uh, never been in a stadium that loud. I've never felt so much pride. Uh, but I, I think the the – the more important game was for me was we beat Colombia, which came into the tournament highly ranked, but one or two in the world in Pasadena, 40 miles from where I grew up with all my friends and family in, in, in the stands. Uh, those are the moments that you will never forget. Um, and it's, 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 it's inter interesting because when you've played the game a, a long time and you know, this as, as well, the guys that can deal with the, the pressure, that, that actually go out there to have fun. Let's have fun. Trust my talent. I'm going to go out there and have fun today. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Usually those guys have success. The ones that lock up and say, oh, my God, I, I don't know if I can handle this. And you can see it. The opponent can see it. Uh, that's, that's when you have problems. So um, I was lucky. I was uh, somewhat of a cocky player, and I didn't let those moments get to me. Uh, I had some success and some failures in the World Cup, but nothing better, man. To represent uh, the United States, to put the jersey on, to be one of 11 guys um, that, that represents this great country, there's no better feeling. And, you know, somebody threw that stat at me the other day. I think there's only two or three guys that have, have, um, have started in three consecutive World Cups, and I'm one of them. Um, I'm very proud of that. You know, whether we didn't beat Germany in that last one, but 
Um, it was still Germany, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of pride, man. It's a lot of pride. And when you play against the likes of Iran, um, when, when all the politi political nature of this can, can come to the forefront, you really feel it. You, you, you feel it. Um, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to, to, to really think about it, but you do feel uh, that enormous pressure representing the U.S. What are your thoughts on uh, the social media controversy heading into the game with the post that was put up by U.S. soccer, uh, the U.S. men's national team's Twitter account, and then the subsequent press conference and um, the Greg Berhalter saying that him and the players weren't consulted about it. Do you feel like there should have been some like unified effort by the Federation to get everyone on the same page if there was any sort of statement that was going to be made? Yeah, I think I think um, uh, these are really unfortunate uh, scenarios. You know, when when, uh, you know, something like this offends a lot of people. Now, look, it, 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 the, the, what you alluded to is the problem. There, there should have been a better line of communication there to make a collective decision. But at the same time, I understand how it happened. It probably got to a certain point in the chain of command, and they said, "Don't don't bother the players with this one," uh, and 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 they 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 took the emblem off the flag. So, um, and then you, know, you saw the reaction. I saw it actually on CNN that uh, they, they're demanding that we uh, uh, forfeit the entire tournament for for being disrespectful. Like, okay, that that's not to use the word extreme, but that that is uh, also extreme. I, I think I think these kind of things they can weigh into games like this. Um, I think the intention was to keep it away from the players, uh, but it certainly backfired. Um, I hope it doesn't you know you know affect going forward now because this is this should be something that uh, maybe an apology needs to be made. Uh, but but you know we we don't want to be dis disrespectful of someone else's flag and then expect everyone to respect ours. So from a broader sense, when you played in the World Cup, it was hosted in the same time of year in the summer and generally like the international schedules are in such a way where teams get more of a chance to play and camp together before those games and that hasn't been the case with this world cup for a lot of teams because it's in november because it's in qatar where the weather is is different this time of year so do you think that that's impacted any of the chemistry with different teams playing and maybe some some upsets like you know the Saudi Arabia Argentina upset earlier in the tournament do you think that has anything to do with this being a, a winter fall tournament now look I think I think November put a, a lot of um, teams under in, in immense stress uh, in, in, in the club soccer realm because Everybody had to play, uh, you know, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, you cram the games in just to to allow this uh, tournament to even happen in the first place. Put a lot of players in health in jeopardy. A lot of players who should have been playing on this thing missed it. Um, it certainly has served, I, I would say, the African teams uh, well. Uh, they're just, they, they acclimated faster. They were able to um, to understand their surroundings a lot better than, than maybe the South American teams and, you know, us, I, I think Canada, as well as they played at times and the United States are certainly dealing with it. England is certainly dealing it. Wales, uh, had some issues as well. Um, the weather's different. It's just, it's, it's something that takes a couple of weeks to get used to. You can't just go from it every, raining every day in North London to the dry, desert air i live it live in it in las vegas it's not something that that your body can just acclimate immediately to so especially in a long drawn out tournament like this i don't think they'll ever do it again uh i, I think they've learned a, a great lesson here uh that that this tournament belongs in the summer uh, i'm sure the television rights uh people are, are are a little upset about that as well we we're trying to go i mean to give you a funny story mike you'll appreciate this the other day i'm watching argentina uh, play against uh, Mexico, and I'm watching it actually at a sports book. But the game is on at the exact same time as Ohio State and Michigan. So there, there's a, there, a Mexican group of fans that are really upset that Messi has just scored. But at the exact same moment, there was a huge play for Michigan. So the Michigan fans stand up and start cheering. And one of the Mexican guys gets upset <laughs> and pushes the back. The Michigan guy says, what are you cheering for? You're not Argentine. You, you, you don't like Mexico? And he says, no, man, the M is for Michigan, not Mexico. <laughs> yeah. It's just such an odd thing for us to, to, you know, to be watching a soccer game, uh, but to also recognize that the NFL is happening right now. Some of the biggest uh, college football games are happening. And uh, the, the Americans aren't all solely focused on uh, the World Cup. When we have it in the summer, Americans actually have that opportunity to, to drop everything 
and focus solely on soccer. Uh, so, you know, we're, we should be upset that we missed that opportunity, but I'm living it over here in Vegas. I mean, people are people, some people just don't care because of when it is. And other people are just trying, you can see them desperately trying to find a, a television where they can watch it together or they're just staying home. But I mean, look, I, I, there's a game this morning and uh, I'm kind of watching it as I'm making breakfast for my kids. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get them to school. And, you know, the days are crazy because this is November. This is not June and July. So it's uh, it's very different. So true. We used to have used to having our kind of almost our single focus on the World Cup. And now. Uh, there's certainly other things going on. Talking with Eric Winalda, again, three-time World Cup uh, uh, apparent teams he was on. First American to play in top German league, Bundesliga. Scored the, I love this one, scored the first goal in MLS history. That is very cool. Been coaching soccer uh, as well. Certainly worked for ESPN and Fox as an analyst, uh, as we as we have, uh, have talked about uh, doing Sirius Siri, XM FS uh, right now, uh, FCFS, FC right now as well. I've asked this over the years when I had a show at ESPN. I maybe even have asked this to you a few times. For the men's team, you know, we've talked so much about how the junior leagues in other countries are better than our junior leagues. When is the men's team going to reach that pinnacle again? Are we, are we going in the right direction to eventually be talking about the men's national team? In all honesty, kind of like the women's national team fighting for that number one spot. I don't think it's going to take much longer. And you did ask me this question. Yeah. I think it, you and Greeny, it was like, wait, it was like 2000, had to be 2002. Oh my God, that's 20 years ago. I know, ago, I know. We're still talking about it. But, you know, what are the, you know, one of the funny lines that uh, I think one of the guys at ESPN once had was uh, soccer is the sport of the future and always will be. And <laughs> that, that one stung a little bit, but it, there is some truth to it. You know, what we um, have done, um, you know, over the course of the last 20 years, the league, uh, since it's, uh, we started in 1996 and, and we made a ton of mistakes. We've done it wrong so many times. We've changed our playoff format, I think, 16 times. I mean, it, it, it really is astonishing. And we're trying to find our own way. We're being very American about it. Um, purists like me want us to just, just look, we, it's been going on for 100 years. This is how we do it. Why, why don't we just kind of, File in and find our spot, find our culture and, and our identity and go with it. That it seems simple to me, but we, we're very American about these things. We want to change it. Um, we are going in the right direction. That's the good news. I mean, the academy systems that now exist, Major League Soccer has kind of taken that away from the United States Soccer Federation. So that, that the, the goal is now, you know, when we were kids, although the most genius thing that baseball ever did when we were kids, I was the Baltimore Orioles or I was the Detroit Tigers. Right. I, I, I have no idea who, who, what that means, but as a child, I have to ask the question, uh, who are the Detroit Tigers? And that connection that was made in, 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 in our sport, because the kids today, they look up to NFL teams, they look up to NBA teams and they look up to, uh, major league baseball teams. And, and we know more about the rest of it. It took us a long time to get here where we actually have recognizable brands that people want to know more about. And we still have never figured out a way to integrate the top level to the very the ground level and to put those two together. When we do that, Mike, they, they, things, will, things will certainly get better, but that's what we're trying to do finally. Major League Soccer is trying to connect through their brands with the kids. And that is so much better than unfortunately when, when, when you have kids and they play soccer. What, what do we do? We say, well, why don't you guys name yourselves? Uh, we're the bee stingers. <laughs> okay, great. We're, we're the bee stingers. And that, that's where we lose it. Uh, that's changed. That, that we'll, we'll, we're going to see a big change over the next five to 10 years where, where our young kids have an immediate connection to the brands that represent Major League Soccer. And I think it's genius. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but in four years' time, we, we will be a force. I, I, I truly believe that. That's an interesting point. So when I was growing up, I was on the Chicago Fire's first ever youth soccer team in like 2004, 2005. Um, and so we would get like ticket vouchers every year to go watch them play in Chicago. And we had a connection with that team. And I never really had any sort of like the other MLS games weren't on TV. So I didn't really watch them very often, but I right. knew my local team. And, and that's I think that's really interesting that you bring that up. I also think that like, the way that Premier League now is so accessible to American fans. Right. Could you picture 
American youth sports teams doing uh, a Man U team or, or a Leeds or an Everton <laughs> instead of like, you know, Miami FC or the Chicago Fire and having that sort of connection to the pro leagues too. Yeah, no, it's a great point because Beckham changed this, by the way. If the guy did anything right, and he does a lot of things right, and he even smells good, by the way. Um, <laughs> the truth about him is when, when it changed, because we always looked at things in three different ways, what they're watching, what they're wearing, what they're playing. Now, we had always, as, as young kids, we, we owned the what they're playing because you weren't old enough or big enough to play football. Basket hoop was a little bit too high. Uh, T-ball was T-ball. So what do you do? You play soccer. And in that window was what, what we always kind of judged ourselves at. So when Beckham arrived, it, it, was, it was instead of everybody wearing the Manchester United, Man City, Arsenal jerseys, everybody wanted a Beckham jersey. And subsequently, they ended up being introduced through those games to a lot of American players wearing a different jersey. And what we saw in what they're wearing was the, the U.S. had... I mean, a minuscule number. It was less than a half of, of, of the jerseys that, that were American. There was about 5% were wearing the Barcelonas or the Real Madrids, and they were wearing that jersey. But when Beckham arrived, that number went up. Not just Beckham, but it went up su substantially. And it was something that I think, uh, you know, the, the business side of this took it took you know a good look at and said, oh, how do we, how do we uh, expand on this? And that's why we see uh, the Zlatan Ibrahimovic has come to America. That's why we see Vela. That's why we always see a guy that they get criticized for this that's a little too old uh, to play in one of the top leagues, but he's still a big name and he's going to get a lot of eyeballs and he's an entertainer. Those guys sell shirts. So, and don't be surprised if Ronaldo ends up playing in America, by the way. That's next. But Ronaldo and Messi are playing their own version of a, a Classico somewhere in, 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 in the MLS is on the horizon. But I... I think that's a great point. We, when you look at how soccer is trying to grow uh, and how we're trying to connect with people and, and get, get more eyeballs, more people watching. I mean, I, we won't have the numbers on the Iran game just yet, but 15 million people watch U.S. versus England. That's a big number for us. And, and I think, you know, and of course, what do we do? We go out there and have a zero, <laughs> zero. It's like everything that you don't want happen. But, and then we celebrate it. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's just it would have been so much more fun if it would have been three to two. And, and damn, we could have lost that game. But at least yeah. at least we would have caught the attention of a lot of people. So soccer is growing, guys. And, and, I, and I hate that saying that soccer will always be the game of the future. But uh, I think we're finally finding our future, which is good news. But, but I'm with you going nil nil didn't 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 really pull in those, uh, you know, sitting on the fence fans, unfortunately. And by the way, Beckham parlayed such a great career into a phenomenal potato chip commercial with Peyton Manning about soccer and, and it's football. It's it's oh, so good. So good. All right, Eric, one more and it'd be remiss to not ask you about this tournament this year. Again, we're early in just getting to the knockout round final is until December 18th. Overall, who, who do you see as the favorites in this as we get, you know, in the, get, get closer to the, again, the final is December 18th of who the teams that are playing best now early on? Well, I mean, it, you know, Brazil is, is always going to be Brazil. Uh, Neymar's injury may have knocked him back a notch, but it looks like he's going to be able to come back. It, but it's, just, it's the usual suspects. Uh, it's, it's Brazil. Uh, but look, Germany has stumbled in this one, which was, was really odd. Spain looks the part, but I, I, I'm going to go back to France. I mean, it'll always come down to the best player in the world. What team does he play on? What kind of a supporting staff does he have? Uh, a lot of sports are like that. And that's France. And Mbappe, to me, is just unbelievable. They are, he's already won a World Cup as a teenager, uh, the last one. And, and who's to say they can't do it again? They've had a lot of injuries. Um, they, they lost uh, Kante um, and Cuckoo. And now you know, it, it's really going to come down to – and Benzema hasn't, hasn't hit the field yet. But they still haven't missed a beat, which, which sometimes happens. We know how this happens. I mean, what was that a couple of years ago? It was – quarterback for the Eagles. I mean, he got, they, they came out of nowhere and all of a sudden he's a Super Bowl, you know, Nick, Nick Foles. That's how, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nick Foles. that's how this happens. Sometimes people injuries create opportunity or, or in that, in that opportunity, sometimes guys have a moment and they shine and there it is. I mean, you could, you could actually say the same thing about Tom Brady. And I remember, I remember that whole thing. I was in new England, but Bledsoe lost a job. I remember how that all happened, but it, it was a big call, but man, it paid off. I mean, it, no one would have thought, you know, that, that that would have happened at the time. And we look at it now and call him the greatest player of all time. 
Um, but at the time it, it was, it was, it was after about two years, you're like, okay, this guy's got a future. That's where we are with Mbappe. This kid is so good. They've had a lot of friends. The French can implode. Don't, don't get me wrong. They've done it before. But for some reason, I, I still think uh, I'm in that, that thought pattern that uh, the French will do it again. All right, Eric, uh, I promise you it will not be another 20 years before we, uh, before we chat again. It's just, we're just getting too old to have that much time. I'm in between. I, I, I listen, and I, before we go, I have to thank you for being the, the one voice that I can really listen to with football. And, and I turn you on, and you've gotten me through a lot of long drives when you, when you do the, uh, <laughs> your show. And, and the way you explain the game to me, um, in a way that that's digestible. It's always, we've worked for these companies. We know what people want and, and football is different than soccer. I have to explain it more than, than most uh, when I, when I did that, but man, I, I love listening to you. Keep doing what you do. You are the best in the business in my opinion. Oh, I appreciate that. That, that just means my don't uh, feed, bullshit. Don't feed us. Yeah. That just means my bullshit with conviction is working. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> Eric, it, it won't be 20 years because the men's team gets to automatically get the bid next time. So there won't be as big of a gap between World Cups. All right. Probably. Well, don't be strange. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. See you. Man. Thank you. All right, Mike, enough soccer talk. We need to talk about <laughs> some real football now, which is, I feel like something Stu Gatz would be really proud of me for saying. There was a lot of a lot of football going on this weekend, like we said. Uh, a, a, a few funny outcomes of college football games. I don't want to point any fingers at any former Notre Dame coaches, but maybe you know, maybe they dropped the ball on the way to a potential playoff bid against a team with four wins. I don't know. Maybe that happened. Maybe Notre Dame didn't do so well either. So you know, don't throw stones in glass houses. Huh. But what did you enjoy from this weekend of of college football games? Well, I mean. The, the picture cleared a little bit by some teams and or conferences doing what they do. The Pac-12 kind of Pac-12 themselves, save for USC, which we'll get into with Oregon losing. I mean, uh, unbelievable. Clemson with an outside chance and possibly an outside chance to make it in there, though it was very outside. They stumbled to South Carolina. And let's give South Carolina a lot of credit real quick, shall we? Two weeks in a oh, row. Do we have to? Dropping big time teams in Tennessee and then you think, coming off that monster win, where would they be mentally? And they end up beating Clemson by one it's point. It's crazy. Yeah. The South Carolina team is weird. And it's the first time that they've had back-to-back wins over top 10 teams in program history. So if you're a South Carolina fan right now, you are feeling on top of the world. You're probably wondering why you lost some of those other games this season that, you know, if you beat Clemson and Tennessee, why did you lose those? But you know what? Finish the season strong. I say maybe there'll be a potential matchup with Notre Dame and South Carolina in the bowl game. I still don't know what bowl we're going to end I, up in. Uh, I, I, doesn't I don't understand how any of that. I, I am work with you ACC. completely. Uh, but congrats! I'm a big fan <laughs> of Shane uh, Shane Beamer, the head coach, the young head coach at South Carolina. So they end with two monster wins there, but completely knocking obviously uh, Clemson out of it. Like I said, they were they were not not really going to be in it anyway. LSU had it. I, I think they could have still been the, in it, they, Oh, I definitely think they had an outside chance to get in. I do agree with you. They really blew LSU it. LSU yeah. had a chance to be the first two-loss team to get into the college playoffs by beating Texas A&M and then beating Georgia in the SEC title game, which I don't think they'll do, but they didn't even get past the Texas A&M uh, game, <laughs> so they lost that. So they're completely done. Um, and then there was the talk of Ohio State Michigan. Because of Michigan's garbage non-conference schedule, the thought was if they lost even a close game, they were going to be done. But if Ohio State lost a close game, that they possibly could still be in the running. Well, it turned out not to be that close of a game. Kudos to Michigan, two years in a row now, uh, doing extremely well after, you know, Jim Harbaugh, you know, his tenure there was starting to get questioned a little bit because they, yeah. they weren't getting to the Big Ten championship game. They weren't getting in the playoffs. And now the last two years, boy, that's changed. It's crazy. I mean, if you coach at Michigan or Ohio State, you just have to beat Michigan yeah. or Ohio State. Yeah. That's the job. And so now where a year ago, Harbaugh was taking interviews with the Vikings on National Signing Day, and it looked like he had a foot out of the door. He's back in – probably back in the playoff. They, you know, will play Purdue in the Big Ten Championship. And now I, I'm seeing the Ohio State blogs start uh, asking questions about whether or not to fire Ryan Day, who's done really well against everyone except Michigan. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you're an Ohio State fan, you have to wonder how this happened. Like, the offense looked really 
really frustrating. Yeah. And Michigan was able to to do what Michigan does without Blake Corum, you know, really playing their backup running right. back, you know, being injured. Uh, they just broke off a bunch of chunk plays, and that made all the difference. That's all they needed to do. And it was a close game until the end. It was, I wasn't sure who was going to win until, like, really the fourth quarter. So it wasn't, like, a total blowout or anything like that. But it was – I mean, Michigan really was able to manhandle them in that at that point and win dominantly. So – it was it, as far as Michigan Ohio State games go. I mean, if you're a Michigan fan, you are feeling oh, really good about that. Listen, 45-23 win. It was stunning to me just watching that game. Jim Knowles, a D coordinator who came over from Oklahoma State, I'm a big fan of. But I mean, this was the definition of doing the same thing over and over and getting smoked by it and not learning. They were giving up chunk plays. They're a man team. They figure we got the athletes that could stick with their guys. They kept doing it at times, having no safeties in the back. And it just kept killing them, whether it was a long pass or a long run. And they just kept doing it. And Michigan kept beating them as they were doing it. So kudos to Michigan for doing what they did. So I think Georgia's beaten LA. Even if Georgia loses, they're in. But I don't think that's going to happen. Michigan is going to take care of of Purdue, and and such a shame, man. The starting quarterback for Purdue hasn't been with the team practicing. His bro, his, uh, family lost his his brother, uh, so he's been dealing with that. Just a, a really really tough uh, situation going on there. Uh, but but I think you know over, overall Michigan is going to take care of business with Purdue. TCU is going to be an interesting one. They have Kansas State again. They beat him thirty eight twenty eight in the regular season. And then SC um, uh, playing playing Utah, uh, the one team that they lost to, and they lost to in yes. what a forty three forty two game. So yeah. it was a it was a close game. So all four of those teams, I mean, they control it. They all win and they're in. All right. So Jess, out, out of those four teams who all control their own destiny, which which team do you see with the best possibility of losing? I don't know if I can see any of them really losing. I mean, there's always there's always something crazy that happens this weekend, right? I guess conference championship weekend. A lot of these teams like Georgia have been have been waiting for for this weekend the entire season. They knew they were going to play in it, but I don't know, Mike. I I think they're probably. I mean, maybe TCU, maybe USC. I don't know. The thing about USC is that even though they have Caleb Williams, who is a star, he's probably going to win the Heisman. He looked incredible against Notre Dame. Um, they have a lot of weaknesses on their team too, in particular their defense. And I think that that might be something that can be exposed, whether it's this weekend or in the playoff, I'm not sure. And as far as TCU goes, I mean, they've, they've won a lot of close games. At some point you think maybe one of those comes back and, and bites right. them, you know, playing close to teams like Baylor uh, or, you know, earlier this season, Kansas State with, with injury luck for TCU. But at the same time, like they, they're giving me team of destiny vibes. Uh, that's not like <laughs> a great analysis, but I would love to see them finish the season undefeated and make the playoff and not have to worry about some, some other team like Alabama uh, leapfrogging them. No pun intended with the, with the Horned Frogs there, but that would be great. So I, I guess it's which team will be in if one of those teams loses. Are you taking the one loss Ohio State team who got beat pretty bad? I know a lot of it happened later in the game, but they got beat bad. They but, did, yeah. But they're a one loss team to what will probably be the number two team, you know, in Michigan. And so are they the first team to take a slot or is it going to be, you know, are we talking about again, Alabama, <laughs> you know, with two losses, finding a way to get in there. I think I, I hate, I hate this. I hate that I'm saying this, but I think Alabama making the playoff, it, it's probably the least likely scenario, but it would be the funniest. It would be so funny, not only if they made it, but also if they somehow won it. I don't know why I'm rooting for that. Maybe it's just because I hate all these other teams so much, like we talked about last weekend. But it would be hilarious if they lost two regular season games. And they were close losses, too. Yeah, yeah. And still somehow made it in uh, just because of the fact that they didn't do anything over conference championship weekend to knock themselves out. That's kind of the problem, though, right? Like, how do you move up if you don't play? That's why if you're in a conference championship and you're in one of these positions to win, you're, you're in the better... Uh, scenario there 
than if you're if you're not playing at all. But Mike, I don't know. This this year has been fun. I've heard a lot of a lot of people talk about how this would have been a great year for the twelve team playoff because yes. there's so many like yes. teams right in that like middle higher tier that could deserve a shot. But at at the same time I'm like are any of these teams even very good? Like, I have no idea what to expect from anyone other than Georgia. I think Georgia's clearly, even though they haven't been dominant in every game, I think they're clearly the closest to championship caliber and a team that I don't expect to let me down the next couple games. But I don't know. It's been a weird college football Oh, season. yeah. And just last week it was like, oh, it's clearly Georgia and Ohio State. They're going to be playing in the title game and then Ohio State – get smoked. And that's the thing about it. Any team that's going to jump up is basically a team that's sitting and watching because we're talking about Ohio State. We're talking about Alabama. You know, is is Tennessee still going to be in it, which I find hard to believe because, you know, the ACC title game is Clemson and North Carolina. Neither one of those teams is going to be in if they win. Uh, that so that that's not going to happen. So you're not going to get a conference champ there. So it is going to be a team if one of the top four slip up that will not play. And we've seen that before. We've seen Alabama do that uh, before. So it has been wild. And, and, and I still think this would have been a great first year for the expanded playoffs because I think we've seen enough out of like. Now, again, the caveat, the caveat with Tennessee is they don't have Hendon Hooker anymore. If they still had him and they were somehow an expanded playoff, we've seen them be exceptionally great at times this year. Um, so I... I wish they would, but, but you know, it's not. So that's not what we're going to have. I just, it's tough for me to say that I think the four will just say, which have, it's going to include USC now, <laughs> um, because we lost that game. Listen, well, I, we that game didn't start great for us, the Notre Dame-USC game. I happened to be in Philadelphia before the Eagles-Green Bay game watching that. And, and then I watched our offense, like, pass their way into this game, yeah. you know, with Drew Pine, which is something we hadn't seen all year. And I watched Caleb Williams from USC, you know, doing his best Patrick Mahomes. You know, of just it was unbelievable. We're we're there to make a play, and we couldn't make a play on defense. It was just it was stunning to me. He was running for his life on every single play, and still turning turning something or making uh, getting something out of it. Yeah, he's making chicken salad out of chicken shit is what he was doing. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. And it was frustrating to watch, you know, the defense not be able to to sack him. But, I mean, I know Notre Dame fans were not happy about the lack of holding calls in that game. We don't need to get into all the officiating and everything like that. I mean, he was making plays on his feet. He was throwing passes while, you know, running across the field. Like, he was – he really put that offense on his back and was – and the Notre Dame fans are not going to enjoy being on his his Heisman highlight reel uh, in a in a month or, or a couple of weeks when that happens. No. But he he played really really well, and Notre Dame's defense wasn't able to really contain, uh, especially on that opening drive. And then you know once once you're ten points under yep. in the yep. first quarter and they're stopping you every now and then, it's kind of hard to come back from that with with Notre Dame. But the season's over. They're eight and four. I think at the beginning of the season you said eleven and one. Pete Sampson said twelve and zero. I said nine and three. I guess I win that bet. You will. was the closest. You win something you we, didn't want to win. Yeah. We all went over. Yeah, uh, was not the season that any of us expected. But you know, USC USC was the better team. On they Saturday. were. It they, is what it is. They were. We had two bad losses with Marshall, obviously in Stanford. People do need to realize we played you know ninety nine percent of the season with a backup quarterback. Um, yeah. and, and, but a lot of people say that's not an excuse. And, and I don't want to sit here and use it as an excuse because we shouldn't have lost those two games. It probably should have been a, a legit 10 and two, but we weren't, yeah. we were eight and four. We'll wait and see what bowl game I'm with you. The bowl game thing is, is crazy, but we know a lot of it is about who you can attract. And we know Notre Dame people will go, uh, yeah. so they'll, they'll go, you know, to whatever bowl they go to. So last question before we get to the NFL. If Michael Mayer calls you and say, Jess, should I play in this bowl game? Because we know he's going he's gonna to go to the NFL and he's going to be the top uh, tight end taken in the draft this year. Zach Bowers from Georgia will be the top t- tight end taken next year because he can't go off this year either. Uh, they're the two best tight ends. Um, Mayer will probably win the Mackey Award as the best tight end in the country. Would you, and if he said, Jess, should I play in the bowl game or just get ready for the NFL? What would you tell him? 
I would say, why are you asking me this? Don't you have an agent? Like, get out of here with that. Because he, no, he feels <laughs> he feels you have the knowledge that he needs, Jess. So he's asking you and, and you tell him. I mean, I would tell him no. I think that's pretty obvious, especially because it's probably going to be like, you know, the Duke's Mayo Bowl or something right. like that. Right. But I don't know what this offense really looks like without Michael Mayer at the same time. I don't know how much the bowl game matters like it should matter a little bit but it does doesn't matter that much it's not a new year six game like i mike i don't know these are questions that i think the older generation of notre dame fans really cares about and well, like maybe the younger players are like eh like you know we're more interested in what we can do next year this is kind of like an exhibition game for us i, I and, and you know what play. because of where this bowl game is going to be i agree with that Older people like myself, see, w- when I was playing, you never thought of skipping a game. You just went and you right. played. But it's a different world now, and I understand that. And and in all honesty, Mayor shouldn't play in this mm-hmm. game. There, there's no need to. T- t- one, one, you can get hurt. You've already proven you're, you're the best here. You can get hurt. Two, let's let all the younger tight ends play. I mean, yeah. these 15 practices that you get is a great time to get the young guys, and remember the rule changed where four games constitutes accounting for a year, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. It used to be the first four games of the season. Now it's any four mm-hmm. during the season. So you have guys that haven't played those four games. They can play in this bowl game. So you can play younger guys. You can practice younger guys. It's time. And there's some really good young tight ends behind Michael Mayer. Give them all the time now. Give them all the practice Give them the bowl game because they're the guys you're going to count on next year. So I think that part of it has really changed to what you're looking to do in the bowl game because you can play guys uh, in bowl games that won't the year won't count against them. So uh, that part of it has changed. So you, uh, that's what I think will happen. They'll get the young guys going and, uh, you know, kind of springboard into next year. We'll see. But we'll wait and see which bowl game. I'd love to see a Notre Dame-South Carolina matchup. That way I could make a bet with Darius Rucker and, and win again. <laughs> um, but because uh, we were actually he and I were talking about making a bet if Notre Dame and South Carolina women's soccer team made it to the finals and they both lost. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, we even get close to that one. I think the finals are in Omaha or whatever. But yeah, so that one didn't work out so well. So. So we shall see uh, where it ends up. We'll see after the championship games what our final four is. But uh, wouldn't shock me if it stays with what it is, which is Georgia, Michigan, TCU, and USC. So uh, so we will see. Um, on to the, to the NFL. So you say you didn't I, – I thought all three uh, uh, um, Thanksgiving games were really good. You said you didn't see that third one, though. I slept through the third one. The, the Giants-Cowboys game was very exciting. Uh, what a crowd. I, what a, what I a viewership it had. I Turkey. Yeah. Yeah, crazy viewership, like you said. Um, it was – It was. A, I think it was a really fun Thanksgiving slate. What stood out to you from it? Um, I, You know, Kirk Cousins not usually playing well in prime time and did, <laughs> you know. I yeah. mean, that was – because we wondered about it's Minnesota. It's a Thanksgiving miracle. Right. You wondered about Minnesota because of the way they got destroyed by Dallas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it was it was horrific what, what happened. You started going, uh-oh, okay, here we go. Now the true Minnesota team is going to show up. Uh, you know, but but they get that win uh, on on Thanksgiving, and so and, and Kirk Cousins played well in that. So I thought that was obviously uh, a, a big a big plus there. As far as the week, I mean, you know, I, is anything changing on our on our thought process of who the best teams are? I, I've seen people start to say they don't think the Eagles are the best team right now. I think I just did that game, and they never they never could really. They were getting two scores up against mm-hmm. Green Bay, but unbelievably, Jordan Love came back in and got them uh, close in that game as Aaron Rodgers, you know, got an oblique and a rib in that game and already has a thumb. And that's a big question going forward. Should he mm-hmm. play? And, and basically, it's going to come down to him wanting to play. And so he, he probably will until they're mathematically eliminated. Um, I, th- but- I think this week was a bigger week for, like, who we know for sure stinks. Like, the Saints, the Rams – they really both stink. And, like, even maybe you could say the same for, like, the Bucks and the Browns game, not doing anything to inspire fan bases no. from those teams. Uh, I mean, the Bears, we, we knew they stunk. So uh, the Bears, I mean, so the Bears, it's almost like, so Justin Fields doesn't play because he's got the shoulder. And, and obviously, if he's healthy enough, you want to play him. But if there's any question, it's like, 
man, I don't, I don't want that dude dealing with an off-season rehab. So yeah. I'd be careful what you do with him because you know he's your quarterback and you got to build around him, right? So there's that. With Cleveland, there's now, okay, it has not gone, even though they pulled out that game in, in overtime, now they get to Sean Watson back. So is there, you know, you saw the Ravens lose. So is there, you know, is there hope uh, for them with the Sean coming back? We wondered how they do after 11 games, and they were four and seven. So they're three behind both the Bengals and the Ravens. So I'm not sure if they have enough time uh, to come back there, even though there's a little bit of angst with, you know, the Twitter of Lamar Jackson <laughs> when somebody yeah. decided to rip him uh, on Twitter. Um, but but I'm with you. The teams that stink, how bad are they? Because Tampa Bay is one under 500 and still leading that division, right? Yeah. So they're still is, there. Yeah. And I, the Rams, so the Rams will will Stafford play anymore? You know, he's in concussion protocol. Now their Aaron entire Do- I'm, their entire team might be in injury. Yes. On on injured reserve the rest of the season. So you wonder, including Sean even, McVay, right? Do you even, oh, did you face. see him get hit? Was oh, that unbelievable? God. Yes. That had to hurt. I mean, he took a took a, a shoulder from his own player running from the sideline onto the field. But the Rams, you wonder if you keep Stafford shut down. Aaron Donald got a high ankle sprain. Do you just shut him down and not and not have these guys have to deal with anything in the offseason uh, to try and regroup? But I still think it's it's KC and Philadelphia as the top mm-hmm. two teams in the NFL, even though I think that the Cowboys are starting to to get their groove on pretty well now as well. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I thought the Cowboys were were fun on Thursday. I thought the actually shockingly the Bills Lions game was fun. I don't think the Lions like have any shot at at no. doing anything, but it was a fun game. It made me maybe a little skeptical of the Bills and what they've been able to accomplish since we found out Josh Allen has an elbow injury. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think I think it's coming into clearer focus now and. That doesn't mean that I don't think like the Bengals or the Titans could make a deep playoff run. I think that's still up in the air. That was a fun game yesterday or on uh, Sunday. But yeah, Mike, this this uh, weekend was a very there were a lot of a lot of games that kind of were head scratchers. Uh, the the team Buc- Buccaneers Browns being one of them. Oh, without a doubt, the team to me that I think is going to continue on the rise is San Francisco. They've won four in a row, just shut out the Saints. Now, they didn't score a lot there. So, you know, with all the power they have on offense, that was that was somewhat interesting because uh, I did the, the San Francisco Cardinals game in Mexico City where they put up 38 mm-hmm. on the Cardinals. That's the team that's really intriguing to me that I think could end up being the best team in the NFC because of the power that they have on offense and the fact their defense, I believe, is still ranked by t- yards per game, number one in the league, and you know they put pressure on the quarterback. So that could be the one team that kind of kind of says maybe it's going to be them to me, them or Kansas City, uh, or them or Philadelphia out of the NFC. And you're right. I think we start to get more questions about the Bills. We, we kept saying, oh, it's Kansas City and the Bills. It's Kansas City and the Bills. That, that's what it's going to be. But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Josh Allen's throwing, throwing uh, red zone interceptions, you yeah. know, and, and you're like, okay, okay, who else could it be? Could it be Miami? I mean, man, I, you know, we all laughed at Tyree Kill when he oh. came over and said, I'm playing with the most accurate quarterback in the NFL. And everybody kind of scoffs because he had Patrick Mahomes, you know, mm-hmm. who's a stud, the best quarterback you know, in the league over in, in Kansas City. And Tua sitting here leading the league in quarterback rating. I mean, it's been incredible. So I, 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 maybe it's we can't. Maybe you can. I don't know if I yet can wrap my head around the fact that we may be talking about the Miami Dolphins as one of the top teams in the AFC, and, and we should give them their credit. Well, let's find out who uh, actually ends up winning that division first. The Bills and the Patriots are playing on Thursday. A, a lot of those, uh, a couple, like the Patriots, I don't think have played more than two division games so far this season. So I don't put anything past Bill Belichick, even though they're, they're, one of the weakest teams in that division, maybe. I think they're in last place right now, but they're still the Patriots, and they have to play the Bills on a short week, and the Bills are, I think, favored on DraftKings Sportsbook, minus five, so that'll be an interesting one to watch, but uh, maybe maybe the Jets will win it, the division too, Mike. Maybe Mike White Mike will White. be the savior of the, of, the, of the season for them. We'll, we'll find out this weekend. Mike White, isn't that, isn't that unbelievable? And I think one of the big games of the weekend is going to be Miami at San Francisco. I mean, 
two of the top teams, you know, meeting in San Fran. So uh, that'll be a nice matchup. Still, obviously, a lot more to go in the NFL than in college where now we're wrapping up, as we talked about with the championship game. So uh, a lot more weeks to go on uh, in the NFL to still have some things break down. So it's 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 football, it's football, and it's football, right? That's what we're watching, pro football, college football, and the World Cup, you know, as along with, as you mentioned earlier, the NBA and hockey and college basketball. I mean, college basketball going on. I mean, I don't even start looking at that until after the football season, and Jay Billis <laughs> used to get mad at me every year for that because, you know, we waited so long to start talking about it. But it's it's almost like the – just the the sports season right now is like Thanksgiving. There's just too much sitting on the table in front of us, and you just don't know where you want to overindulge. That's exactly right, Mike. Good analogy. Thank you.